Good afternoon and welcome to At Yale Live. I'm Eric Gershon. Over the epochs and ages, our planet has spawned a fantastic diversity of life. Today we talk about some of the remarkable species that have come and gone or morphed into something that lives among us now. Our guest and guide is paleontologist Derek Briggs, director of Yale's Peabody Museum of Natural History and a leading figure in one of the most celebrated projects in modern paleontology, the analysis of British Columbia's Burgess Shale. As always, we'll take some of your questions. Please submit them via Twitter to at Yale or by email to socialmedia at yale.edu. Derek Briggs, thanks for being with us. A pleasure, Eric. Let's start with the word paleontology. For me, and I suspect for a lot of people, the first thing that springs into your mind when you hear that is dinosaurs. Paleontology concerns itself with a lot more than dinosaurs. What was it that first interested you in paleontology, and how have your interests evolved, so to speak? Well, paleontology is certainly about a lot more than dinosaurs, although, of course, uh, dinosaurs are our best friend because they, they get the public interested in paleontology, and in, in many respects, they, they introduce the public to science mm -hmm. in many cases. Uh, I was raised in Ireland, which uh, doesn't have any dinosaurs. So in some sense, I was the least likely paleontologist because uh, our home was on the Leinster granite, which is not going to be a very good <laughs> source of fossils. Uh, I went to Trinity College Dublin, and it was essentially about the people that taught me there. Uh, the geologists were some of the, the most interesting, and I, I got very excited about the discipline. And when I graduated, I decided I would like to do graduate work somewhere else. And I was fortunate enough to be offered this project in Cambridge, which, as you said, involved the, the Burgess Shale mm -hmm. with, with uh, Harry Whittington, who was my, my graduate student advisor. So that's, in essence, how I really got into to paleontology. It was at Cambridge as a graduate student. I want to follow up with you about the Irish soil. What is it about uh, the landmass in Ireland that, that doesn't lend it to the preservation of? It doesn't have rocks the right age to preserve dinosaurs. So th the Mesozoic, the, the, the rocks of the appropriate age are fairly few and far between, and those that are there are essentially marine as opposed to terrestrial. So mm. um, Ireland doesn't have um, much of dinosaurs th that one can celebrate. Let's talk about the Burgess Shale. Um, if you would, give us a, a quick overview of why this location in Canada um, is so legendary in, mm. uh, in the field and what the work that, that you and your colleagues and others have done there, um, ha how it's helped change the way that we understand the history of life. Uh -huh. um, I mean, the most important thing about the Burgess Shale, in, in a sense, is its age. It's a, a Cambrian deposit, so it's about 510 million years old. And it sits a little while after the beginnings of what we call the Cambrian explosion. And the Cambrian explosion is that event which gave rise to all the major groups that are around today. I mean, everything from you know, slugs and snails to ourselves, the vertebrates. So it's a, a critical interval in, in the evolution of life on Earth today. Uh, the Burgess Shale is particularly special, however, because in contrast to most localities, it yields far more than just the normal shells. So it, it preserves evidence of the soft tissues as well as the hard parts. And given that... The internal the, organs of... The internal organs, the, the soft tissues that would normally decay away. Mm. And given that uh, most of life is in effect soft-bodied, I mean about 60% of creatures are, are, are essentially soft-bodied and therefore rot away, mm -hmm. without these kinds of extraordinary preservations, uh, we wouldn't have evidence of many of the life forms that appeared at, at that time. And this locality had been discovered back in the early part of the 20th century by a man called Charles Walcott, who was at the Smithsonian. So major collections are at the Smithsonian. Um, my advisor at Cambridge, Harry Whittington, was recruited while he was still at Harvard to start a project by the Geological Survey of Canada because uh, the Canadian science community, I think, realized that most of the material was in the United States and it was time that it was revisited and restudied, and they invited him to, uh, to run that show, so to speak, 
and he decamped to Cambridge because he was actually a, a Brit mm -hmm. shortly after the start of the project and then recruited myself and, and Simon Conway Morris as graduate students and that's how we how we got involved. And the collection of fossils there is both e numerous, mm -hmm. diverse, and if I'm not mistaken, well preserved. Yes, astonishingly well preserved. Mm -hmm. And the exciting thing about it is that it's still being worked in the sense that uh, there are many other localities in the general area in British Columbia, in Yoho National Park, and indeed outside the park now, that have been discovered since that preserve a range of these extraordinary animals in a, in a spectacular way. Mm -hmm. So the Royal Ontario Museum has been particularly involved. Uh, a man called Jean Bernard Caron is the curator there now. And they're continuing to collect and will be back there this summer, not at the original Walcott Quarry, but at other localities in the vicinity where extraordinary fossils are still coming out. Give us a sense, if you would, uh, tr contrast some of the extraordinarily well-preserved fossils at Burgess with what you might call a typical fossil. Well, if we take a, a trilobite, which will be known to, to some of the people watching in the sense that these are a very popular group of, of fossils. That look, what, what, what is there a modern? Uh, they look a bit like uh, pill, bog, pill bugs or isopods. I okay. mean, they have a, a series of segments and a head and tail. And they were very common during the Paleozoic and equally so uh, in the Cambrian. Those things have a hard mineralized dorsal skeleton and that's routinely preserved. But if you take the Burgess examples, not only is the the outer skeleton preserved, but also the limbs and the gut traces and the internal or traces of the internal organ. So you get the complete animal. Mm -hmm. And equally you get uh, animals that normally don't get preserved at all, that simply wouldn't be present. I mean, things like equivalent to uh, jellyfish or soft-bodied mollusks or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about um, uh, your work and, and that of paleontologists involves the minute examinations of the anatomies of all kinds of creatures. What are some of the, um, the sort of big picture lessons that, that you and your colleagues um, derived from the Burgess in particular mm -hmm. about, about, about life itself and well, I think, um, I mean, several things. Obviously, uh, most important, perhaps, is that the explosion is just that. Everything appears in relatively short order mm. uh, over a period of, of millions of years. Um, and, and all the major groups that we see today have early representatives back in the Cambrian. But the explosion was such that you get a lot of rather odd-looking animals, which are early offshoots of the modern groups, and those... Uh, include some very bizarre kinds of organisms. Uh, an animal called Opabinia is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a thing with uh, five eyes on the head and a long proboscis with a kind of claw-like structure at the end, which we think it used to probe the sediment to pull out, uh, you know, lunch in the form of worms or whatever. Um, there's a, a group of giant predators called anomalocaridids that got up to maybe six feet long which had uh, a pair of claw-like appendages at the front, which uh, they used to you know, sweep up prey. So there are animals there that, that we wouldn't recognize as familiar today, but when you study them in detail, it's quite clear that their descendants, can, not their descendants so much as the, the same lineages continue today, even though they were sort of early unsuccessful offshoots of that. Now these are all marine animals, is that In this correct? case, they're all marine animals, okay. yes. Is that a coincidence, or what is it about, I don't know, the evolution of the Earth, say, that, uh, and geology that has yielded this incredibly rich deposit of, of marine animals? Well, life on land took a while to get going and yeah. didn't, didn't really start until significantly later. So the kinds of organisms that might have been on land at that stage would have been near shore, maybe algae or slimes or that kind of thing. So nothing that's... Uh, particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. So the origins of the terrestrial groups also in some cases appear in the Cambrian, but they don't actually get out onto land until much later on. So life in the Cambrian was essentially marine, so that's where the fossil record mm -hmm. is at that time. Let me ask you about mass extinction. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, as I understand it, there have been several, maybe five or so mm -hmm. major mass mm -hmm. extinctions, uh, some of which wiped out the vast majority of all things plant and animal that were alive on the earth at the time. Obviously bad for those individuals and bad for the species. 
good for paleontologists. That is, have, have mass extinctions been um, an especially good source of material? Not really. I mean, ma mass extinctions are events in the evolution of life, which, yeah. as you say, involve wiping out large parts of the biosphere. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the potential for getting fossilized mm. increases. And indeed, one of the real challenges of studying mass extinctions has been looking at the details of the record and tying them down to a particular age or date because you need complete sequences of fossils to show where that event occurred. Mm -hmm. So there's no correlation between the number of fossils that survive and the mass extinctions Got themselves. It. I mean, the, the late Cretaceous one that, that removed the rest of the dinosaurs, if you like it, about 65 million years ago, was largely down to a, a major impact of a, of a bolide from outer space. Um, that kind of event doesn't necessarily mean that you get more things fossilized at precisely that point in time, but it does mean that large parts of uh, life at that time were, were wiped out, both <coughs> on land and in the oceans. Hmm. So how do paleontologists think about extinction? And is it, is, it, is, it, is it a concept that you have to wrestle with very much? Yes, I mean, it's, it's routine and inevitable in the sense that by and large uh, organisms only last for a certain length of time and then disappear or give rise to other uh, forms of life. Um, mass extinctions are those events where there's a significantly higher level of mm -hmm. removal, if you like, normally due to some kind of event or some combination of, of circumstances. So we think of mass extinctions as exceeding the normal threshold of, of background extinction. And clearly, people now talk about the sixth mass extinction, which will be, in a sense, down to us as, as humans and the kind of environmental impact we have. Mm. And that's about what's disappearing and, and in particular, the rate at which it is disappearing and, and what kind of effect that's likely to have. I guess, uh, you know, you could take one of two views about um, extinction um, and mass extinctions. One is, that the, at least the past ones, one is that it could be kind of a downer because uh, it seems safe to assume that we'll go extinct at some point too. Mm -hmm. But uh, taking a, bi a bigger, less parochial view, uh, it's, it's heartening that life has rebounded every time. Right. Yes, no, right. Life has certainly rebounded, but it, it rebounds on an extraordinarily long time scale yeah. relative to the one that you and I are familiar right. with. So on a human time scale, um, you know, we can't think of recovery in that sense. It takes millions of years and has done. Uh, is, there, is there a reliable estimate for the number of species that have ever lived? No, I mean, we don't really know even how many species are on the world today. I mean, mm. that's one of the major challenges for biologists now, uh, to document what is actually on the planet before it gets <laughs> extinguished. So uh, estimates of the number of species that have ever lived are based on extrapolations from what we know of the fossil record and what we know of the diversity in certain parts of the globe today. Mm. But there are no precise numbers that are reliable. Let me ask you about a... A species, uh, I believe it's a, a new species that was has been in the news in the last few days. I, I guess um, scientists in Argentina have oh, discovered yeah. a, a new dinosaur that they've called uh, the Titanosaur, mm -hmm. and I guess it's the 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 latest biggest dinosaur right. known to man. Uh, big dinosaurs, big things. They're appealing to everyone for their their novelty. Mm -hmm. Put us in the mind of a paleontologist, though. What are the other kinds of questions the, the, that a serious academic paleontologist is going to be trying to, um, is going to ask himself and, or herself and uh, try to uh, learn about life with this more broadly? Of, with this kind of discovery. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, this thing is, I, I've seen pictures, as obviously you have. Yeah. Uh, it, it's colossal. There's a, <laughs> there's a wonderful picture on the web of uh, an Argentinian scientist, I suspect, or excavator, at least lying next to the femur of this thing, and it, it considerably greater than the, the height of him. So I think this thing was about 20 meters high and maybe 40 meters long. Um, Argentina seems to be blessed with a number of these huge dinosaurs, as you say, these titanosaurs. So what will they be asking? Um, is it new? And clearly, given its size, I think it's highly likely that it, that it is. Uh, to what extent can they reconstruct it completely? because uh, skeletons don't always, in fact, it's unusual for a skeleton to remain intact. And my understanding is they have several individuals, so I suspect they'll be able to piece that together. 
and then what kind of impact would it have had on the ecosystem at the time? Mm. This was a late Cretaceous sauropod, so it was one of those massive herbivores, and you can think about uh, <coughs> you know, the amount of vegetation required to keep large numbers of these things going, what, if anything, was preying on them, uh, what kind of impact they had, as I say, on the, on the, the general ecosystem of the time. So mm. but, but these discoveries are, are very exciting, and of course they keep uh, paleontology on the, on the pages of the news, and, and earth science and indeed science in, in general. I mean, many of us, of course, get interested in science in the first place because we're excited about dinosaurs. Let me take a uh, question from <coughs> a member of the public uh, who, um, this is a, a question about uh, museums. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about museums and science, linking them together. <coughs> You're the director of the Yale Peabody Museum. Caitlin McQuaid Facebooks us to ask, what are the best ways that you found to connect museum visitors and the rest of your community with the research that your scientists are doing? Well, ideally you keep your exhibits changing as far as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so that at the Peabody we've always had this philosophy that we will use uh, Peabody research or Yale research and incorporate it as far as possible into our exhibits. So for example, we presently have an exhibit uh, called Tiny Titans, which is about baby dinosaurs and their eggs. Uh, that includes uh, some research done by Peabody curators, but it also includes materials from our own collections that we've put on display to, if you like, augment the exhibit. So we have spectacular birds' eggs and birds' nests, because those are the closest things to living dinosaurs. So it's about keeping your collections and your research in the exhibit program as far as possible. And our approach is to do lots as far as possible of, of temporary exhibits. That's how we bring back repeat visitors. Mm -hmm. And also when we have the resources to renew our permanent exhibits. Mm -hmm. I'm going to follow that with a question from uh, Steve Bryant, who also by Facebook, uh, and I'm, I may butcher the pronunciation, but you'll correct me. Um, he wants to know if there are any plans for the Peabody to acquire ambergris. Oh, ambergris. We have ambergris is material produced from sperm whales. Uh, we have some. Indeed, uh, I did a quiz for our members' dinner a week or two ago, and I, what I do at that quiz is I put odd objects out and give them a series of possible solutions. Ambergris was one of the ones that the collections people offered me as a potential, but we thought passing it around at the dinner table <laughs> and people handling it mightn't be exactly ideal. So if he wants to come in and see that, we can certainly do that. I see. So it's uh, it's not on display normally. Oh, no, it's not on display. That is true. That, but we that certainly have some in the collections. And uh, like, like many great museums, am I right that there's a great deal in the possession of the Peabody that you're, that isn't on display all the time? Well, yes. I mean, we, we have about 13 million objects. I like to say roughly 13 million, that I'm yeah. still counting them. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we have, a, we have a huge collection which ranges through everything from fossils, which we're talking about this afternoon, to historical scientific instruments mm -hmm. and, and everything in between. And you might say, why? And the answer is, is very simple. I mean, we're essentially a resource for research scientists, not just at Yale or even in North America, but right across the world. We have visitors who come in and work on our materials, and we, we steward those for, for future generations. Mm -hmm. But we also use our collections very much in undergraduate teaching. So we reckon that we know that more than a 1,000 Yale undergraduates a year take courses that use the Peabody mm -hmm. collections, everything from ornithology to ichthyology to various kinds of paleontology. So the collections are vital, not just for display, but also for the research community and for our own students. And of course, from time to time, we get queries from other kinds of individuals as well, and we accommodate those. I mean, that's essentially what our mm -hmm. mission is. Let's talk about horseshoe crabs for a little bit. Right. Um, <laughs> you've done some work on horseshoe crabs. I've done some work on horseshoe crabs, yes. And and uh, I've always th thought of them as a sort of evolutionary success story. I mean, mm -hmm. they've been around yeah, they have. more or less continuously for something like 450 million years. Yeah, even a little longer, mm -hmm. actually, yes. Yeah, so we, we, we have uh, undescribed examples. I, I have a wonderful locality in, in the lower division of, in, 
about 475 <laughs> million years. I slip into the jargon. For about 475 million years old in uh, near Zagora in Morocco, okay. in a unit called the Fezzouata Formation. It's south of the Atlas Mountains, just into the into the desert, and I'm working it with one of my postdocs, uh, Peter Van Roy, who's a, from Belgium and, and effectively discovered this material. He's working on horseshoe crabs from Fezzouata, which some of which are very similar to living ones. Um, so yes, they go back about 475 million years ago. So what's the secret of their success? Uh, hard to say. I think in essence they were probably generalists, and they're still generalists. So they were able to cope with changes in their circumstances because they didn't depend on any single resource and were probably very tolerant of, of changes in their environment and in their food mm -hmm. sources and, and so on. So but adaptable. Adaptable. So in a sense, that's speculative, but there's obviously good evidence that they've persisted for this length of time. Yeah. We have other extraordinary horseshoe crabs in a younger locality in England uh, that I'm also working on. It's, it's in Herefordshire on the border between England and Wales. There we have them in concretions. They're much, much smaller, but they preserve uh, not just the dorsal morphology, but very good... Uh, information on the limbs mm. and if you look at a modern horseshoe crab uh, it has a set of appendages at the front that it walks on and also feeds with and then the gills are back in the rear part mm -hmm. of the animal um, in the case of this silurian example there are large numbers of additional branches on the front limbs and we can figure out how those evolved into modern horseshoe crabs and indeed uh, some people have done work on the genetics of, of horseshoe crabs and shown what controls the presence and absence of limbs during development. And we may be able to relate that kind of genetic story to how these things evolve based on our, our fossils. So yeah, they're some of my favorite animals, I have to say. I read a story in the New Yorker not that long ago about modern horseshoe crabs, and it sounds like they, they may not be f faring as well. No, the they're in trouble. I mean, th they're they're used for fishing bait and of course they were used heavily for I mean they were I think they still are bled for their the hemocyanin in their blood so I think it's like many other resources we're tending to overuse, overuse them overuse them hmm. you should know that of course there are no living horseshoe crabs on the other side of the Atlantic where I was brought up so from me you know people say they look like the sort of dinosaurs of the invertebrate yeah. world my first meeting with them was actually one of my peers is a graduate student at Harvard who kept them in tanks in his office, and I came to visit him. Um, and it was love at first sight. It was love at first <laughs> sight, yeah. I mean, they they just fabulous animals, extraordinary animals. Um, so tell us, uh, you, you've uh, spent a great deal of time, I imagine, out in the field, as they say, um, hunting for fossils and uh, presumably finding them and bringing them back to your lab and so mm -hmm. on and mm -hmm. analyzing them. Um, do you have any favorite personal fossil discoveries? I think, I mean, to go back to the Burgess Shell, as, yeah. a, gra as a graduate student, um, I worked on Walcott's collections in the National Museum of Natural History in Washington for months and months and months. Never, because there weren't opportunities in those days, went to the field. And then when the Royal Ontario Museum started working on this material, exploring the, mm -hmm. the, park, the Oho National Park, I joined some of the early expeditions and was able to walk on what I would call virgin scree slope, so where the, the rocks uh, spall out of the outcrop on the mountain and, and form those marvelous slopes down the sides of the, the mountain, um, walking on those where nobody had been and literally picking up things that I recognized because I'd looked at them as a graduate student. I mean, it I would, you know, would have had the opportunity that lots of, well, very few others had. Yeah. So it was that kind of, uh, well, it was just mind-blowing, frankly, to just pick these things up on the side of a mountain. How is, um, <coughs> excuse me, how is technology changing the way paleontologists go about their work? I think in, <coughs> in some fundamental ways. I mean, in, in the end, paleontology is about discovering new fossils and, and using your eye and your brain and your background to figure out what's going on. Um, it's been transformed by databases and our ability to analyze huge databases. So we can now look at patterns of change in diversity through time in ways that used to be done 
I mean, figuratively, at least on the back of an envelope mm. with a calculator. But we can now put huge amounts of information into a computer and recognize, for example, those mass extinctions mm -hmm. uh, in very clear and detailed ways. Uh, technology has allowed us to peer into fossils. Uh, CAT scanning and three-dimensional reconstructions by computers is now a very powerful and widely used method for uh, looking at even the tiniest fossils with mm -hmm. uh, the synchrotron or synchrotrons now around the world. Um, and we also have much better, better methods for analyzing the chemistry of fossils and understanding mm -hmm. how they get preserved and indeed much more accurate ways using radioactive elements to work out the age of fossils, so mm -hmm. down to levels of precision that were unthinkable even a, a few years ago. So yes, in many very fundamental ways, the, the discipline has, has changed. To what extent does the work on the soft tissues depend on technology that's available now that wasn't 50 years ago? Or well, I mean, some of it, imaging is is hugely advantageous. Mm -hmm. So if you can if you can penetrate using X-rays or CAT scans and get at materials that are far too delicate to prepare manually, or with chemical methods, that's a, a huge advantage. Uh, we can analyze the composition of different structures within a fossil, and sometimes the chemistry gives us information about their nature by comparison with with modern things. Um, so th those kinds of approaches certainly have changed how we would do this kind of thing. We're not just reliant on microscopes and, mm -hmm. and drawing. Are, s are, are new fossils, though, still the sort of sine qua non of paleontology that is? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, because otherwise, you're, you're just working with the same data. Yeah. So, I mean, new discoveries are the be all and, and end all. I mean, your new titanosaur in Argentina, case in point. Um, people are out there looking for fossils all the time, mm -hmm. and every time a new one's found, it's like another piece of a gigantic jigsaw. We don't know how big the jigsaw is, but yes, I mean, new discoveries are the, the bread and butter of what we do. You can't advance the field without them in, in really significant ways. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you've done some work uh, with others on the color of ancient animals. Yes. Um, I, I can't recall if it was dinosaurs in particular or, s or maybe several, several creatures. Um, but how does that work? That is, y how do you discern color if there's nothing to see? R right. Uh, this, this was work I did with two of my group. Uh, one was Jakob Winter, who was a mm -hmm. graduate student at the time, who looked at the melanin in squid ink, of all things. And melanin, uh, squid ink preserves quite well in, in fossils. We also get melanin in, in feathers and fur it gives that dark color. Uh, and we get other kinds of colors, structural colors in insects, which we've also looked at. So Maria McNamara, who worked with me as a, a postdoc, and I know you met her, mm -hmm. um, she did some extraordinary work on fossil insect moths mm -hmm. and beetles, looking at how the scales and layering in the cuticle gives rise to structural colors, which are evident in the fossils. I mean, we get, we get examples of what you would call jewel beetles or scarabid beetles in, in deposits in various parts of the world. And those colors survive. They're altered, but she worked out methods using the physics to restore them mm -hmm. to their original color. But I suppose the most spectacular thing we did was constraining the colors on some of these feathered dinosaurs from China, which was Jakob Winter's work. So we were fortunate. We got a little uh, animal called Anchiornis, a very late Jurassic form, which is a bit like a, I mean, a big fluffy chicken. But uh, we were able to constrain the feather color to black, gray, white. And, and the wonderful thing about this from the point of view of the, the public interest was mm. it, has a, it has a crest. So it has a kind of punk appearance. And that crest has uh, melanosomes in it, which are spherical. And that tends to be correlated with red or rufous or orange color. So we have this this sort of black, white, gray general plumage and then marvelous red crest at the top of it. So it really captured everybody's imagination. Outstanding. Illegal trade of fossils, also been in the news um, in the last year or so, sure. particularly with respect to dinosaurs in Mongolia, if I'm That's if right. I'm not no, mistaken. you're quite right, yes. To what extent um, is this a, a serious problem from the point of view of academic paleontologists? 
Uh, well, we're extraordinarily careful. I mean, if you run a yeah. museum as I do, uh, you're absolutely obliged to figure out what the provenance of the material yeah. you might want to acquire is, and you never collect without permission, and increasingly nowadays in collaboration with local collectors. But of course, people around the world make a living collecting and preparing fossils, and sometimes those things are exported without the uh, proper permits. I mean, mm -hmm. if they turn up at auction or uh, in museums, people generally tend to blow the whistle. And as in the case of that Mongolian dinosaur, uh, my recollection is it was repatriated back to Mongolia. I believe that's the case, yeah. So uh, the right thing in the end happened. I mean, a spectacular specimen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, aside from the important you know, moral and social questions, mm -hmm. what about the material? That is, does it seem to be you know, rampant enough that private collectors who maybe just like the object as art mm -hmm. um, are hoarding objects that would be of real interest to science? I'm sure there are collectors out there that mm -hmm. have materials that are of interest to science. I have to say that my experience is that many fossil collectors of that kind of people who buy and sell fossils mm -hmm. are are usually people who are very excited about paleontology mm. and therefore inevitably get into conversations with paleontologists. And many of those people have been very generous with allowing access to their material mm -hmm. for study and in, in many cases um, donating it to museums when they're, if you like, no longer interested in keeping it as a collection or bequeathing it so that it, we know that it'll end up in a museum in the end. And that's, of course, the best possible scenario where y they have resources, they have interest, and they accumulate fabulous material, mm -hmm. and then it eventually ends up being properly described and, and in scientific hands. The worry, of course, is that not always is the provenance properly documented, and that's often very important in terms of understanding the context of the, the fossil mm -hmm. specimen. Let's end on a uh, philosophical note, as it were. Right. Um, <laughs> Paleontologists, like many geologists, uh, like um, astronomers, study something that uh, offers uh, a very long time, uh, well, a very long horizon, as it were. So, is when you when you think in terms of hundreds of millions of years, right? Um, and you spend all this time with these creatures mm -hmm. from from so long ago, how does it affect your view of humans and our species and sort of mortality. I mean, you realize that we're just a blip in the evolution of life, that um, you know, lots of things have been out there and lived a great deal longer, existed a great deal longer than we have, but because we now are the, the first species to, in a real way, control our environment, um, we have an enormous responsibility, which I'm not entirely sure we're always uh, standing up to and, and uh, taking on board. So, I, you know, I think that's a message we all of us need to get out as scientists, that um, we are, in a sense, making a mess of things, and, and we need to make sure that that stops. Derek Briggs, thank you so much for joining us on At Yale Live. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks very much to all of you for watching, and I hope you'll join us again next time.